real quick, I just want to do an append to the last message on Matthew 5 because it was kind of a mess. I mean, I just woke up, had a question in my email, and answered it uh, and wandered around. I stuffed way more into that message than I should have. Um, so I just want to like do a quick summary uh, of the main points. The main point is that, number one, Matthew 5 through 7 is really speaking of entering the kingdom. And when he's talking about the kingdom, the Jews knew exactly what that was. It was the kingdom with the Davidic throne, with with their Messiah ruling, with a rod of iron, and Israel exalted among the nations. And they should have known that there would be a new covenant, okay? Uh, that the law-keeping was not working because the it didn't deal with their moral nature so he points to the moral law the ten commandments and says look this is a matter of your heart okay now in that sense so in one sense it does not apply to the church matthew 7 5 through 7 in a way does not apply for the church because it's speaking of the kingdom it's to the jews it's for those who are under the law and a lot of damage has been done by trying to synchronize these passages with uh the pauline um books as if it's all just one thing without realizing that no we have christ in us we've been buried with him in baptism into his death he is our righteousness okay um so on the one hand it does not apply to us on the other hand it does if we use it correctly knowing that the law is not for the righteous but for the sinners and it is for the purpose of exposing sin but we have not used it correctly until it produces the kind of despair that the sermon on the mount produces so if you have not read matthew 5 and despaired then you haven't read it right if you've never read it and been in fear then you've never read it right you've not read it literally enough you've not applied it to yourself uh, okay, but if you read it with an honest heart, really wanting to be able to enter the kingdom and yet still ignorant of Christ as righteousness and substitutionary atonement and uh, justification by faith, then the way you should respond to Matthew 5 through 7 is absolute terror. <laughs> so, That's the point, is that to teach the law to sinners should produce the right kind of effect. It should not make them think they're keeping it, okay? It should do the opposite, because the law was given to reveal sin. It was given for transgression. Now, that's specifically speaking about the Ten Commandments, which Paul says were written on stone and were a ministry of condemnation and death. Now, the law of ordinances and commandments also includes the ordinances of the ceremonial system, the Aaronic priesthood with the temple and the sacrifices, which was a picture that pointed to two things. One, that Christ would eventually be the Lamb of God and that God would have a way to reconcile man to himself and eventually the Holy of Holies would be opened and the Spirit would be made available. But the other thing it points to is the fact that as long as that system stood, it was actually an obstacle keeping people from being able to come to God. Because only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. Everybody else was either in the outer court or in the holy place. And as long as those things stood, it shows shows that the way into the holiest had not yet been manifested and the worshipers had not been perfected. So the law could make nothing perfect and yet it's fulfilled in christ except he's greater he has a greater priesthood than aaron which is melchizedek which is according to the power of his life it is the king and the priest he was not of the house of aaron he was of judah right or he wasn't of levi he was of judah so he had no part in the aaronic priesthood as the seed of david but He has part of a better priesthood in resurrection, which is Melchizedek, which combines the the authority of his resurrected life and his priesthood, which brings us into the presence of God 
and brings many sons into glory. And that is a priesthood where he ministers his life as bread and wine. Melchizedek comes with bread and wine. That priesthood predated the Aaronic priesthood. And it was that priest, Melchizedek, that came and blessed Abraham. Okay? Uh, so it existed before. And the fact that the psalm says that, you know, in the day of resurrection, he will make his son, thou art my son this day, I have begotten thee. You are a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek forever, uh, means that there's another priesthood that God in the scriptures bore witness to that is the reality, the real priesthood that the other pointed to. So when it says that Christ is the manifestation of God's righteousness, witnessed by the law and the prophets, but manifested apart from the law, it means that the whole system witnessed to him, okay, and in that sense he fulfills it as the reality, but not by literally keeping it, because he is not keeping the Aaronic priesthood, he's keeping the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, and thus fulfilling the scripture in every point. You know, if he were, yeah, I hope that makes sense. He fulfills everything if you put it in its proper place. What is the purpose of the law? It is to show you that there's an obstacle keeping you from coming to God. And it's your sin. And the Aaronic priesthood did prefigure grace. And the moral law, which is also part of the law of commandments, was a ministry of condemnation and death to show you your need for something. And at that time, the Aaronic priesthood was the answer, but it didn't perfect you. It didn't bring you to God. It just kept you from being thrown out of the camp, you know. But even being thrown out of the camp didn't necessarily disqualify you from your inheritance if you were a believer. So because the inheritance was guaranteed to all the seed through the everlasting covenant that God made between with Abraham's seed, which is Christ. Very complicated. I know this is very complicated, but this is what, uh, how you distinguish these things. This is called rightly dividing the word. You understand what is the function and the purpose and the audience for these different portions of scripture. The audience is the Jewish people who are anticipating their kingdom and the function of the Sermon on the Mount is to show them that they're not qualified. Okay, the, that's the function. But the purpose is to show them their need for Christ. So Christ is the righteousness. The law points to it, but his life is the reality of it. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. It's hard to speak to um, without just speaking and speaking and speaking, you know. But um, this is a, this is, there are two, there's, there's a lot of different backdoors to legalism. And this idea that we're under the new covenant is a backdoor for mystical legalism, what I call mystical legalism, and spiritual perfectionism. And the idea that we are uh, in the kingdom now is a backdoor for law-keeping kind of righteousness. Um, so we have to be clear about these things. And then, again, the whole point I'm addressing is this idea of vicarious law-keeping that Jesus kept the law and that was reckoned to us. No, Christ himself is given to us. He reckons his righteousness to us through faith, but then he's given to us as life. You know, it's his life in us that fulfills what righteousness the law points to. But it's manifested apart from law. We have nothing to do with law. We had to die to it in the body of Christ, that we may live unto God. All right, take care.